Yellowstone supervolcano, pyroclastic flows were huge and produced the Lava Creek Tufts. The pyroclastic flows were three massive P flows. The Yellowstone region produced ex three excessively large volcanic eruptions in the past 2.1 million years. The pyroclastic flows from these eruptions resulted in rock formations called tufts, T-U-F-F-S. The Huckleberry Ridge Tuff was produced during a caldera forming eruption thought to be one of the five largest individual volcanic eruptions known anywhere on Earth. This is all details for uh, pyroclastic flows at Yellowstone from the USGS site that I'm reading from. So the first was the Huckleberry Ridge Tuff, which is known to be uh, one of the five largest anywhere in the, in the Earth from this eruption. A similar smaller but still huge eruption occurred 1.3 million years ago. This eruption formed the Henry's Fork Caldera, located in the area of Island Park, west of Yellowstone National Park. That produced another widespread volcanic deposit called the Mesa Falls Tuff. The region's most recent caldera forming eruption, 640,000 years ago, created the 35 mile wide, 50 mile long Yellowstone caldera that we see today. Pyroclastic flows from this eruption left thick volcanic deposits known as the Lava Creek Tuff, which can be seen in the south facing cliffs east of Madison, where they form the north wall of the caldera. Contrary to what the media portrays. Yellowstone is not overdue for a caldera forming eruption. There is no requirement that Yellowstone will have a fourth caldera forming eruption. If it does, it will not necessarily follow any particular schedule. The actual average of the two intervals between the three eruptions is about 730,000 years, significantly greater than the time elapsed since the last super eruption. Nevertheless, we cannot discount the possibility of another such eruption occurring sometime in the future, given Yellowstone's volcanic history and the continued presence of magma beneath the Yellowstone caldera. Now, concerning the Lava Creek Tuff, it's a tuff forming formation in Wyoming, Montana, and Idaho. And we can see from the map that it stretches most, it, it encompasses most of the United States, and it even goes into uh, parts of middle of Canada. The Lava Creek Tuff is distributed in radial uh, pattern around the caldera, forming 1,000 kilometers or 240 cubic miles of ignimbrites. The Tuff has been exposed by erosion at Tuff Cliff along the Gibbon River. Lava Creek Tuff ranges in color from light gray to a pale red in some areas. Rock texture of the tuff ranges from fine-grained to aphanitic and is densely welded. The maximum thickness of the tuff layer is approximately 590 to 660 feet. Can you imagine all this coming out of Yellowstone and it, the height of it being 660 feet? This an unbelievable super eruption. Now, what is exactly are ignimbrites? It's a variety of hardened tuff. Ignimbrites are igneous rock made up of crystal and rock fragments in a glass shard ground mass, albeit the original texture of this ground mass might obliterate, be obliterated due to high degrees of welding. The term ignimbrite is not recommended by USGS, uh, IUGS subcommission on the systematics of igneous rock. Ignimbrite is a deposit of pyroclastic densely current or P flow, pyroclastic flow, which is not which is the hot suspension of particles and gases flowing rapidly from the volcano and driving uh, driven by uh, being denser than the surrounding atmosphere. Now in New Zealand, the geologist Patrick Marshall from 1869 to 1950, derived the term ignimbrite from fiery rock dust cloud. Ignimbrites form as a result of the immense explosion of the P-flow. Lapilli 
and blocks flowing down the sides of rocks. Ignebrites are made of a very poorly sorted mixture of volcanic ash, or tuff, when lithified, and pumice, lapilli, commonly uh, with scattered lithic fragments. And the ash is composed of glass shards and crystal fragments. Ignebrites may be loose and unconsolidated or lithified or solidified rock called lapilli tuff. Near the volcano source, ignebrites commonly contain thick accumulations of lithic blocks and distantly many showing meter thick um, accumulations of rounded cobbles or of uh, pumice. Ignebrites may be white, gray, pink, beige, brown, or even black, depending on other com uh, composites and density, and many pale ignebrites are dacitic or rhyolitic. The darker color ignebrites may be densely welded volcanic glass or less commonly mafic in uh, composition. A base modeled uh, on observations wall mountain tuff at Florissant Fossil Beds National Monument, Colorado, says that the rheomorphic structures such as foliation and pyroclasts were formed during laminar viscous flow and the density current comes to a halt. A change from particular flow to a viscous fluid could cause a rapid on mass cooling the last few meters. It also theorized that. Transformation occurs at a boundary layer at the base of the flow and that all the materials pass through the layer during deposition. The green tuff in Pantelleria contains rheomorphic structures that are held to be a result of post-depositional remobilization because of the, the time the green tuff was delivered to be uh, believed to be a fall deposit which was no lateral transport. Similarities between the structures of the green tuff and ignebrites on Gran Canaria, the Gran Canary Island, suggest post-depositional remobilization results uh, when, uh, of the late stage primary viscous flow. Now, the petrology of this. Ignebrite, composed of volcanic ash or tephra, composed of shards of volcanic glass, Pumice fragments and crystals. The crystal fragments are commonly known apart by the explosive eruption. Most are thenocrysts that grew in the magma. Some may be exotic crystals such as xenocrysts, derived from other magmas, igneous rock, and from country rock. The ash mystrix typically contains a variety of P2 cobble sized rock fragments called lithic inclusions, and they're mostly bits of older, solidified volcanic debris entered from conduit walls or from the land surface. More rarely, glass are a cognate material from the magma chamber. And what minerals they contain? Ignebrites are biotite, quartz, sanidin, or other alkali, feldspar, occasionally hornblende, rarely proxene, and in the case of phonolite tufts, the feldspatoid minerals such as nepheline and leucite. And the geochemistry. Most ignebrites are silicate, silicic, generally over 65% uh, SiO2. And the chemistry of the ignebrites, like all felsic rocks, the resulting mineralogy of phenocrysts population within them is related most to the varying contents of sodium, potassium, calcium, and lesser amounts of iron and magnesium. Now, as you can see, the map here of this tremendous amount of ash and tephra that has fallen from the uh, not only the Yellowstone volcano eruption, but you also have the comparison of the Mount St. Helens ash fall from 1980 and you have the uh, Mess Ash uh, Falls ash bed, the Huckleberry Ridge ash bed, and the Lava Creek ash bed. And these were the three separate eruptions that have piled on hundreds of feet of ash and uh, tuff all over the United States. Again, from the uh, 
USGS volcano, Yellowstone Volcano Observatory, ash and tephra hazards from Yellowstone, the most likely type of volcanic eruption that Yellowstone would produce, lava flows of either rhyolite or basalt, rhyolitic lava eruptions could also include explosive phases that might produce significant volumes of volcanic ash and pumice. Such eruptions could range in size from smaller than the 1980 eruption of Mount St. Helens through much larger than the 1991 Mount Pinatumbo eruption. Now we're talking about the uh, future eruptions, not the past. We're talking about what they could include, in, uh, what they would uh, include. The lava flows would include the the uh, lava eruptions, the uh, ash and pumice as well. Now, the least likely but worst case volcanic eruption at Yellowstone would be another explosive caldera forming eruption such as those that occurred 2.1 million, 1.3 million and 640,000 years ago. Such an eruption would produce ash columns that exceed six miles covering much of the United States with some ash, once entering the stratosphere higher than about uh, six miles up, the ash particles could circle the whole globe in combination with the sulfur dioxide emitted during this, such an eruption could cause global temperatures to drop. But the probability of such an eruption in any given century or millennium is exceedingly low, much lower than the hydrothermal explosion or lava flow eruption. Lava flows and associated hazards at Yellowstone, again on USGS, Yellowstone Volcano Observatory reports, the most likely type of volcanic eruption at Yellowstone would produce lava flows of either rhyolite or basalt. Uh, basalt, of course, as we know, is uh, cold lava. These would be significant and produce flows with volumes greater than one cubic kilometer but all of these would most certainly remain within the boundary of Yellowstone National Park. Since Yellowstone's last caldera forming eruption 640,000 years ago, about 30 eruptions of rhyolitic lava flows have nearly filled the Yellowstone caldera. Other flows of rhyolite and basalt, a more fluid variety of lava, also have been extruded outside of the caldera. Each day, visitors to the park drive and hike across the lavas that fill this caldera, most of which were erupted since uh, 160,000 years ago, some as recently as 70,000 years ago. These extensive rhyolite lavas are very large and thick, and some cover as much as 130 square miles. That's twice the area of Washington, D.C. During eruption, these flows oozed slowly over the surface, moving at most a few hundred feet per day for several months to several years, destroying everything in their paths. An eruption of lava could cause widespread havoc in the park, including fires and the loss of roads and facilities, but more distant areas would probably remain largely unaffected. If rhyolitic lava flows do erupt, they could also include explosive phases that might produce significant volumes of volcanic ash and pumice, such eruptions could range in size from smaller than the 1980 eruption of Mount St. Helens through much larger than the 1991 Mount Pinatumbo eruption. If you'd like to join me on my Patreon account, you will hear content not covered by mainstream media. These riveting stories will be based on my research and I will state my opinions and give my personal insight on diverse and controversial subjects and world events, events not covered by mainstream media and not certainly on not supported by YouTube guidelines. So whatever I have on my Patreon, most of those will not be on my YouTube channel. Please consider becoming a member today. More of the, the most significant and important videos will be on my Patreon channel. Your support helps me to continue 
my research and keeps this YouTube channel alive. And we depend on your support, your generous charity, because we help economically challenged families here in Athens, Greece, in Kapota, and we also help the young generation with university tuition and the community around our church. Thank you.